Incoming communications from Foundry Files, the entirely devoted to the Foundry podcast. I'm Admiral Murphy. And I'm Wee Wee, the better person for intros in this situation. Shut up. I, I have the best. <laughs> you know what? We're going to throw up a poll. Vote for who you like introing the show more. I don't know the thread. And then we'll have a meeting. Inside joke if you don't get that. But anyway, yeah, um, uh, this week we're covering Foundry news and stuff. There's a lot to talk about. There's been tons of dev interviews, so we'll cover who's been interviewed this week. There's a lot of good stuff that came out of there. Then we are going into quick tips for space and ground combat with Mr. Wee Wee. And then a review of Captain Revo's Cleon series. I believe the first part is called Crouching Demons of Tigra Core or something like that. I don't know. It was a big, long title. Yeah, which you can't pronounce. I can't pronounce. Um... So yeah, pretty good week though. I got into the Neverwinter beta and have been playing that. I've been having fun with that. It's pretty good. Uh, but I can't say much more about it because it's a beta. So sorry guys, I can't tell you what I think of the Foundry, how it's implemented, how the gameplay is. But once it's open beta or something like that, we'll be discussing. Because I also think you have a uh, you're in it now, Wee Wee too, but you just haven't played yet. So no, I have I'm sorry, yeah. So we'll talk to you guys about it once we can because it's been pretty awesome. But we've got that. Uh, oh my God! More taunting us about the Romulans. Though. I want to cover that before we get the news. They are taunting us still. I think by the time this recording uh, finishes, comes out, and this episode comes out, it's only just a week away. From, from uh, just yeah. over a week away. As of now, it's literally like just under eleven days. Um, so that means episode twenty, the day that comes out, we get that big announcement that day. So. Man, that's, that's gonna, gonna be, be awesome. That's gonna be rather inconvenient, really. It, it is. Honest, Maybe we should do day, a quick update. I know it's not Foundry, but this and the day we put this out is the day it gets released. Ah, that's sometimes when the schedule doesn't work out as good. But I'm yeah. pumped. That screenshot yeah. that they have up there is awesome. I I don't know what it is. I've heard rumors that people think it's Iconian. I I think it's based I, off. I, 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 what, what do you mean? What do you mean the? They think the three fingered lady thing. being held by the guy is an Iconian, like kill. It was Killer Bin. Why could she got three fleet. fingers? It's obviously all right. All right. It's, she's got three. She's got a, actually. She's got a thumb and two fingers, not three fingers. Correction. And it's probably just the way the image was made. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I apparently she he's hasn't got two fingers. She's got four. It's just. <laughs> the way she's displayed on the image is inconvenient. I don't know what an Iconian looks like. Apparently the uh, Tier 5 or whatever mission, Tier 4 Romulan Reputation mission, gives you like an image of one. I haven't played it yet. Just unlocked Tier 4 today, so I'm going to go play it and check it out to see because I need to know what an Iconian is going to look like. But anyway, I guess we should get into Foundry news and see what's going on with the Foundry. And welcome to Foundry News. This is where we cover news related to Foundry. Not SDFs, not lockboxes. Sadly, though, I would love to cover some of the new lockbox news. Actually, there isn't any. That's kind of sad. Cryptic, get on the ball. We need a new lockbox. Let's go. Anyway, this week, Podcast UGC sat down with Gecko for not one, not two, not three, but four hours to talk about Stowe. My God, can they talk over there? I don't think I could go for four hours. <laughs> I mean, I talk quite a bit, but I don't think I could do a whole interview for four they, hours. They did something similar, like, over a year ago, didn't they, with Gecko? It was, like, two or three hours of this, but, but this four. was just like, ugh. That was so... It your entire afternoon. I was lucky. <laughs> I, to the one I listened to that while at school because it's not important. But anyway, I just listened to that throughout <laughs> half the day, and then eventually it ended one of my classes. And I was like, thank God. I had another podcast I had to listen to that day. I forget what it was, but it was just like, geez, now I can move on and listen to the next show. But there was still a lot of good stuff they talked about in that show, so it's not like you're wasting your four hours listening to it. They did talk about some pretty interesting stuff. They didn't get into Foundry until about the last hour, because Gecko's not heavily involved with the Foundry, but he kind of knows what's going on there. So go ahead and give that a listen to. Uh, two, I did make two points, because I actually had a dock up when I was listening to it, just to go, oh, uh, anything interesting I'm hearing for Foundry I can throw into the show? But, uh, they did talk a little bit. I try and find it. It, it. They did talk about the grinder civil war thing in the, a bit there, and asked for his opinion on it. I got the sense he thought it was dumb too. <laughs> uh, so, but basically, in his opinion, it, it's the founder was just made to make missions. Now, the only thing they're going to kind of cringe at is exploit missions, where you kind of can kind of go away. And he he specifically called out those people, going, "We know what you're doing," and. 
that's why they've tried to put a stop on it. But they're they're okay as long as people if people spend forty five minutes playing a grinder mission, it, it seems like Cryptic's okay with that. At least from Gecko's perspective, it's forty five minutes of them playing their game, so they're all right with that. Uh, I'm still not going to care for them, and if they went away, I'd probably be fine with it still. But I'm not going to let it bug me really anymore at this point. I would like a better search tag feature, which they did also talk about that a bit. Um, I'm hoping, because at first they were kind of like, so we're thinking of having three tags, one for story missions, one for, they didn't want to call it grinders, but maybe just combat missions, and then one for both. And luckily, I think all the hosts on that show were able to convince them you need more than those three tags, because I heard them like, no, you're going to need a lot more tags than that for a tagging system, because the more tags, the better. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Wee Wee? More than three tags? Definitely more than three tags, but there is that concern that those people with those kind of grinding missions will still have yeah. the system. Yeah, they that's, were worried about that too. That's something that was going to happen anyway. You can't stop that. It's, it's going to happen anymore, anytime you it's tag. It's impossible to stop that. That's always going to happen. It's player base. Um, but having this tag system will not only possibly replace the, well, not replace, I mean, like, add to the the scoring of the different reviews of different missions, but it also mm -hmm. like uh, hype up different missions in a different way. So more combat oriented missions will be searched for by a lot of the player base, for example, because a lot of the game is gameplay based. Yep, and um, players, that's what they do. Yeah, and they'll probably look for those combat missions, those type of things, and story missions or diplomatic missions will all need to have their own tags. So it, there's a lot more than three tags necessary. For the yeah, because maybe you want a diplomatic mission, or maybe you just want to take on the Romulans, or you're looking... Stuff like that. There's a lot of different missions out there, so I think there need to be a lot of tags. But I do like that they're, they do realize that it could be abused, and some people could obviously select them all. Yeah. So they're trying to look into a way where they can't select... Like, say you have combat, story, and both. I don't know how... That's the example he gave. You can only check off one of them. You can check off all three just to go, I'm in all the categories, woo. So they're definitely yeah. looking into that so that you can't have two polar opposites checked off when it can only be one or the other. So that's good that they're looking into that. Um, and then I also remember him throwing out the stat because everybody always wonders, how does a mission finally qualify for rewards? And it seemed like it's after 20 reviews it qualifies for the rewards based on if you have enough stuff in it to make it over 20 minutes or whatever it will then at that point qualify for review so it takes five i believe to be viewed by everybody and then 20 to get into the review system so that's what he said there so it's good to hear that number now because there are some missions out there i know that are still kind of bugged up and um you know i'm going to skip down to their uh, to prime time ugc talked with zero who's like their qa tester over there and also is in charge of making sure the foundry's working and stuff gets added into it so all those art assets we saw, all the toss ones, she's been adding those in recently. So they sat down and talked with her on a variety of subjects. You can also go and listen to that interview. So Zero kind of dealt with the, the bugginess issue of, of the reward system, because there are some missions out there that aren't getting the rewards tagged onto them, even though they're over 20 minutes. Because we played a Jupiter Force mission made by one of our fleet members, who his mission was for sure, if you read all the dialogue and stuff, it would take an hour. We played through it, skipping through the dialogue, and it still took over 20 minutes. And yet, it's not getting rewards, and it's like 80 plays or something like that. So there, there's definitely something still up. And so she, she's, she was apologizing on the show that they are looking into that to see what's going on there. Because they want it to be perfect, and they want it to some as something that's not punishing Foundry authors, but something that's rewarding Foundry authors. Because if your mission's not having rewards tagged onto it, that's really not bringing a lot of players to play your missions. Because they want to play missions that have rewards on it. So... That was being looked into there. And she also covered a huge variety of other topics on their uh, show. So two big interviews this week to uh, that involved uh, Foundry that were pretty interesting to listen to. So combine that all together, you got five hours of devs talking. So we'll boom. Have fun listening to that, guys. Um, and then the last point here is there was a Foundry guest blog recently. So again, this is on Primetime UGC. They're like a, a video... What, it's like a machinima podcast. All their their visual footage, if you haven't checked them out, is like in-game footage using demo record and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. But uh, So they're doing a, what is called a Foundry Authors Academy. I don't know if you've heard of this, but what they're planning to is like three weeks starting, uh, it seems here, March 23rd on the Saturday. It's going to be like they're going to get a bunch of Foundry authors together to answer some questions from new Foundry authors. And then... 
it's like they're going to have a foundry competition for those new authors to kind of learn the tool, then create a mission, and then they're going to award the best new authors some prize or something like that. There's a, there's a whole bunch of details in there, a lot of details actually. So go ahead and give that a, a reading because it's definitely seemed like an interesting event. I'm definitely going to pay attention to that. So it's going to be pretty cool to see. But that's been all the news with Foundry this week. I think Wee-Wee's ready to cover some quick tips in... Oh, it's named perfectly. Quick Tips. And on to Quick Tips. This week we are doing Space and Ground Combat, the next section between Space and Ground. Last week we did Gameplay. This week, we're going to do the other side of that, the combat section. Now, space and ground combat can be quite difficult to get right for players because it, it completely relies on the player playing the mission to have a specific setup. What I mean by that is like a tactical captain in a bird of prey or defiant, for example, will find it a lot easier than someone who flies an odyssey, primarily because of the orientation of that ship, cannons against beams, all that kind of stuff, system stuff. Uh, the same thing applies to ground combat. Uh, except there's no ships. It's, each profession will have its own bias towards a certain combat action, and it will be a similar situation on the ground as it will be in space. So that kind of thing is pretty much universal. It's just slightly, only slight difference between space and ground. The best way to try and get around this is to multi-stack relatively lower end groups types, such as ensign level, frigate level mobs, that kind of stuff, maybe lieutenant and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this will gain good flexibility as the positioning of the mobs will come into a factor here. Because the mobs too close to each other will overwhelm the player really, really easily. If you're Murphy, you'll die pretty quickly. Um, whilst mobs too far away will feel like more of a trauma. Kill this thing over here, then go to here, and then go to here. You, you don't want that. Uh, some groups are harder than others. For example, Horogena are pretty con considered pretty hard on the ground, actually. The, all the Tetran weapons and the, the melee weapons and all that kind of stuff, whereas Things like Undine, I mean, whilst they can be irritating sometimes, they are pretty squishy with a good setup. Finding a happy medium is the best solution here, but be careful where the mobs are placed because people will shout at you if they're not placed properly. And on to our mission review. Crouching Tiger Core Hidden Demon. Whoa! Uh, it, that name will sound familiar to you because this was one of the first four Foundry missions back in the early days of Foundry that was spotlighted by Cryptic. In Old the first one. year anniversary, I think it was. Yeah, then they uh, stopped the spotlights. Kind of like they stopped yeah. them now. Brad, we need more spotlights. Anyway, this mission by Captain Revio was part of one of the Clank. Revo? Revo. It's part one. He's of a guy. Hang on series. Five part. Hang on series. Is it five? Because it just said part one on there. I was like, how many parts is this? Yeah. I, I assumed it was somewhere around part five. One, yeah. Yeah. I, I checked earlier in the, the founder list. It's five parts. So I'm glad because there are quite a few weeks to cover. So this is part one. I'm, I'm glad it's not ten cover. parts because I know there's a founder series that hit like twelve parts or something. I was like, oh my oh, god, right. that's a while. I there's definitely gotta be oh. a lot of story in there. <laughs> Well, as of this recording, it has 3,926 players with Tons. an average star rating of 4.09. So, it's doing pretty well up there. Especially for a, a Klingon mission. Nearly 4,000 players, yeah. And it's a Klingon mission as well. Yeah, because usually that's a pretty good number for Fed missions, but for a Klingon one to hit that when their percentage is a little lower than the Feds, that's pretty good still. So, a lot of people have been playing this mission and hopefully enjoying it. We'll okay. give you our thoughts now. Oh yeah, and I had to persuade Murphy to try and do a Klingon series since we were doing series now. I want to play a Romulan. Yeah, I... Romulans are cooler. We we just live with it. They're awesome. They got ships that look cool, and and Iconians in the background running things. So, but anyway, it's up to you to stop the Fakiri invasion of Tigracore. But this simple mission to put down that threat is going to reveal hidden enemies' true intentions and their agenda, which I guess is going to come into play in the uh, next couple of episodes and stuff like that. But it's a good starting point for this series. It definitely has some is some interest growing in there and what's going on, but it, it's not like huge plot twists and stuff like that. It's good, but it's not like, oh my god, this plot's amazing, best thing written ever. But it's still pretty oh. good. Yeah, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't really expect it in the first mission, really, to be honest, would you? Cause it, yeah. Traditionally, first missions are sort of like the start of missions. It's supposed to draw you in for the rest of the series. And, and it did succeed at that. And onwards will 
really get into it. The more plot twists, more stuff will happen, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it did pretty well for a start, I imagine, yeah. Yeah, because it definitely draws your interest into, there's there's a, uh, there's a bad guy working around in the background, and you're like, what are they up to? And that's what's probably going to be answered in the next couple parts, so I'm interested to see that. Uh, the characters weren't so good in this mission. There's only really the one, I believe, that you talk to. And you just talk to them. It's not like you get any of their personality or anything like that. So really, there's yeah. not much work put into the characters to tell the story. It's really just you going through the actions and stuff. So I think there's only like um, a couple of instances where you actually encounter that person. Yeah. Um, so it, it isn't exactly a hype up. No, it's so it's just like, oh, who's this guy? But you don't really get to know anything about him. So it's kind of like, eh, hopefully in future parts of the series, because definitely a series, you definitely want to have some good characters to talk to. So hopefully either that character is expanded on that you meet, or m new ones are added. I believe I've played part two already of this series, and I believe that that some more characters are added, so I hopefully they're pretty good. But uh, the dialogue varied throughout the mis this mission. It was kind of weird. At some points, it was really well written, because I was reading, I was like, oh, this is great Cleon dialogue. It doesn't have a Federation copy feel, because you don't want that at all in a Cleon mission. You want the Cleon experience. And At times, it was perfectly written. At other times, though, it was really simple. Like I remember there was a, a part where my boss pop-up just comes up and they, they just say this way sir or something like that it was just three words on a pop-up dialogue and that was it didn't have any real interest in it it was just like oh okay so it kind of varied at different points throughout the mission there uh there were no canon contradictions and there was a little bit on uh touchstoning on the fakiri and graythor of course you got a touchstone on that when you're covering this race and no tiger core. oh I'm right tiger. what is tiger core because i didn't recognize this so a lot of people might miss this um well tiger core was the the heavily fortified system where Cisco, Odo, Wolf, and O'Brien attempted to expose Garon as changeling at the beginning of DS9 Season 5, and it turned out Martok was the changeling instead. That was the system. This system is that same one that you're, in, that you're going into this mission. Mm -hmm. It's the same one. So it's heavily fortified, and that's why you'll find a billion different outposts in it. So now I can kind of understand why there are those outposts, because when I look at that map and look at oh, what the uh, the episode kind of shows that system, it does look quite the same, so you did a good job kind of recreating it. But I, uh, I had no spelling and grammar issues. Story scored a 7.43, our 27th ranked in story. So it's a definitely a good start, and uh, I do feel that it's a, I would recommend it for a little bit of the story here so far for a, a Cleon player to go play through. And again, I haven't played many Cleon missions, so... I've only played some named by some crazy British guy who likes chobes. That's about it. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know him, but I, you, do you know him? I don't. But anyway, yeah. on to technical. Uh, the map usage was pretty basic for this mission. Now, it's kind of understandable because this is a, an old mission, so it was created early on in the Foundry days. But uh, So there's a, like a space map where you kind of go to the Kittimer, what is it, not the Kittimer system, it's the uh, Quadra Sigma what? Quadra Sigma, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the system where you do uh, Kit Kitmer, there. Yeah. And so you go there, and there was some extra customization to that, which was cool to see. Uh, and then you go to Cleon, Cal uh, Cleon Colony that the guys built. But other than that, a lot of it's pretty basic. And I did have a few issues with the first map that you go to, Tiger Core. So while he did a good job trying to, to recreate it with the space stations and stuff, the one problem I had with this map was everything was on the same level. And I remember when we viewed The Worst of All Worlds, that was one of the problems I had with that mission, for the maps at least, was everything was on the same plane. It wasn't like some stuff was higher than others. Everything was on the zero coordinate. Planets, asteroids, ships, all of that. And in space, space is huge and in all directions. You want stuff on different levels to make it look right. I can, I can see it that from a technical perspective, from also from a gameplay perspective. The game is kind of limiting in, in how three-dimensional it works. I mean, you can't belly roll everywhere in yeah. every possible direction like bridge commander um, but you can still go up like and down, down a little down bit it's quite limiting to like what is it 60 degrees I think is the turn something down. like that you can't go directly yeah. up but you can go pretty close yeah. and I, I would actually more lean towards that the plane could be considered sort of like not very well thought out three dimensions but it could also be considered convenience for the player because the player might not want to just go rolling around in the same spot all the time just to get to an objective below them yeah, because it's really hard to hit your W and S keys when flying in space to make your ship point a little bit down or up. So, so. yeah. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and then the uh, the transition of the missions were all right. There was one map that could have probably been removed when you beam down because you just beam down, fight a squad, and then go into a base. It's like why couldn't we have just beamed it in the base? There wasn't really a story reason given, so it was just kind of like that map could probably be removed. And most of them were pretty short. 
I know you yeah, definitely said they were most short. Most of them were pretty short, yeah. Gen generally, they, they, were, they, were, they were all right. There was nothing too outstanding that could have been improved. Um, I mean, maybe the one or, or two maps that could really could have used a bit more stuff in. Uh, but generally, it was actually pretty good. Yeah, there wasn't too much. Yeah, I didn't find myself going, oh, a loading screen, except for that one time where I was just like, why did I go to this map? Did I just kill the mob to go into a base? I could just beam in. But uh, that was still pretty good. Uh, the author showed great knowledge of the tool set. Uh, there was a question we kind of had, though, like when we discuss it, and we kind of get more into this because in Foundry Limitations, we've discussed this before, but he reskins a couple of the ships to be dreadnoughts. And from a story perspective, I can see why an author would do that, because maybe you're going up against a ship that's supposed to be the Dreadnought, and it makes sense for a story reason. But in this mission, you really don't get that. W why did the author feel they had to change into a Dreadnought? Because it's not like, oh, the battleship's decloaking. This is the flagship of this group. It's just, oh, we're fighting a ship now. Yeah, we, we encountered a similar thing back in, I think it was uh, a mission a few weeks ago. Yeah, like two weeks ago or something? Was, um, yeah, where one of the battleships was reskinned as a Vakuv. Mm -hmm. And of course, Vakuvs in this game are Dreadnoughts. They're Dreadnought level. So uh, it's the same kind of idea. Was it really necessary to reskin a battleship for a Dreadnought when he could have just used the battleship very easily? Because it, it's kind of limiting that kind of thing. And I think that boils down to how old this mission really is. Because back in the day, that was usually a preference because there was nothing more you could do with it. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, and it's kind of funky when you, you easily destroy a scimitar on its own. Like I find it's easier when you combine a whole big fleet because you don't notice it because all these ships are out here. But at one point you only take on a scimitar, but of course it's just a battleship. And I think we both fly escorts on the Cleon side, so of course we do a lot of DPS to blow these things up quickly. So Whereas a Dreadnought, if you were actually taking one on, it'd probably be a little more difficult to kill it. But in a battleship against your escort that's hopefully his is skilled out better than mine but uh it, it, it's really easy to take down these ships so it kind of breaks the illusion of you actually taking on a scimitar i mean if you came up with a story reason to say this scimitar is badly damaged we could probably easily finish it off that makes sense but i think maybe go back and look maybe just make it a battleship or something unless you have a really good story reason why it needs to be changed um some limited art asset usage in this mission. It wasn't like huge, but he did use a little bit to customize the maps. Like he built the colony and he added in a couple uh, of things into the uh, the Kitimer Accord space map, whatever that's called, Quadra Sigma. I keep forgetting. Uh, but he's customized that a bit because some stuff's changed there because an enemy's built the base and stuff. So there's been a little bit there, but nothing major to make like new maps or make something look completely different. Um, which kind of goes into creativity. There's a little bit of creativity shown in the Quadra Sigma system, but it's nothing major. Like, you'll see and go, oh, that's cool. I, You don't recognize it right off the bat until you look at the planet and go, oh, that's a huge planet. Because there's not many maps with a huge planet like that. Like, the only ones I can think of is that map, and there's, like, that Cleon mission, Alpha, yeah, I'll, yeah. where you get the huge like, planet. huge gas giant. This, this massive blue I love that giant. map so much. In your face, and it's like, whoa. But uh, other than that, there's not really those huge plants, so it's easy to kind of go, oh. But but you are in that system, so it makes sense to have that map. So um, The instructions were very good. They clearly ex stated the objectives and where to go to, and their reach markers were good too. So you could look at your mini-map and see, oh, i got to go here. So very good. I didn't find get I was getting lost at all in this mission. And it tells you where to go in the, in the start. initial objectives. Yeah. So very good go there. Down. The only thing I could say, and it's not really needed, is you could add it into your dialogue or something just in the green text but that's about it i mean it's pretty good all around so the players aren't going to get lost and they're going to know what to do so you won't have that drop the mission because i didn't know what to do one star you stink uh and, and then we had this debate again we had this before i think with aj's missions where we kind of have different opinions on it, yeah. ship skinning so that's what we had here again with foundry limitations um I, I didn't take any points off for it this time but i kind of feel like it, it wasn't done as well here like you do have your uh You've got ships reskinned for no reason, and so that kind of goes. Meh. It's not as bad though because they still are the same faction, so you're not noticing different colored weapons and stuff. But it's just like these dreadnoughts are really squishy, so that's something you just might want to look into if it's not really doing anything for your story at all. Technical scored a 5.79 or 27th ranked in technical, so it it does have a lot of room for improvement in technical. I think that's just because times passed on and a lot of a lot of new features have come into the foundry and stuff like that. Like you can definitely tell uh, we'll probably get into in gameplay, but there's not a lot of branching dialogue in this mission. There's a little bit, but this mission came out right as that people were starting to play around with that and stuff. So, uh, 
I'll definitely give it a look around just see where you can improve it technical wise and that should boost that up there uh, and the quality there Game Master Wee Wee, or should I say Dungeon Master Wee Wee, since I'm playing Neverwinter now. Uh, I rolled a 20, so go. That was a terrible transition. Go. Just go yes, talk about it. I'll, 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 sit, I'll sit here and twiddle my thumbs. Anyway, we have a bit of space in, in, in the end helm here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this mission. But it was pretty average. Standard stuff like reach markers, interactable objects, one or two different optional dialogue in Tiger Core with some shapes, but nothing really much beyond that. I was actually quite surprised if mm -hmm. it did. Really wasn't really much beyond that to do in space gameplay, apart from a good battle of combat, um, which I'll go ahead and say initial Fakiri mobs at present, but they're not stacked and are pretty average, really. I mean, you've got a couple of weak groups, you've got maybe a, a, a frigate group, and you've maybe got a cruiser group there, and then you've got a Fakiri battleship, which goes back into the reskinning thing. Because normally Fakiri battleships are car feed carriers, which you don't know to be a playable Klingon ship. But this is one of the ones that's reskinned as one of those dreadnoughts you get in the foundry. It's, it's that huge sort of like tall vertical like a, thing with like spikes a, on. A yeah. skyscraper on. They, yeah, they just the, picked up the road underneath and they decided let's yeah, make a spaceship out of it. From fields, except it's a ship. I want to know who designed that because that's crazy. Um, the carry ships are usually quite tough because the amount of stuff they use, especially coffee carries, they use yeah. you know, just a billion things at once. And it's actually quite fitting in this quest the uh, the dreadnoughts like that because it kind of does the same thing. It only does the whole squishiness thing, which we discussed earlier. Yeah. But um, in later groups, there are multi-stack groups with allies for the player to make this part much more interesting. And I won't say any more than that. Uh, there is a bit of ground as well, but your own gameplay, it was a bit weaker than space, unfortunately. There were limited interactions with NPCs and interactable objects. Four. I counted four. four. Uh, and four. Um, uh, in... It really makes this part mainly decayed by the combat. So, uh, with no puzzles, unfortunately, there wasn't much to do besides interaction and dialogue. So, it's kind of a shame, really. Mm -hmm. um, but, like I said, ground combat mainly dictates that side of things. Some interesting touches, but nothing too difficult with no multi stack groups or anything. No. Some groups are scaled up to captain level on occasion, which is pretty nice, makes for an exchange. Yep. Um, but there were a lot of the time where there wasn't much else to the mobs. I mean, there were ensign groups and there were lieutenant groups with the odd occasion of captain groups, but all single. There were no multi-stack groups, and I think that, actually, back in the day, thinking about it, everybody did that. Yeah. So, that really shows this, this mission. This mission really needs to be updated more, because the replayability is another factor in here. There's not much beyond extremely limited alternate dialogue. And you can tell, this was only, uh, only a few alternate dialogue things were all uh, added in. Jesus, I can't speak today. It's your fault, uh, it's, um, it's the Murphy virus. In. Yeah, added in after finally enabled all sort of dialogue back in the day and it really wasn't updated much then at least I can see um, no so there's not really a reason giving you to replay it not technical wise I mean you can debate oh if it has alternate dialogue is it worth replaying really in this mission even if you want to go back and replay it and choose some different dialogue options no you there's only like I can only think of at least one scenario I remember where I got a choice and I was just like I wonder if this actually changes anything so yeah uh, uh, o o overall I say space is probably the better thing in this mission yeah. than ground I mean well, there are a few inter interesting touches in ground um, especially the space uh, Especially the grand combat with multi stack groups and the um, well, lack of, and some of the captain levels. Space combat does have that. Yeah. It's. Uh, it, it could use some game improvement in gameplay. Generally, play. use a, a lot of improvement, yeah. Especially more puzzles, more interactions, more different things to do. I think is the kind of just here. Yeah. Um, but overall, it's got a 6.57, which put it in 22nd place. So, so pretty good still, but room for improvement, of course. Yep. What do we think overall of this uh, mission? Is it a good first start? Do we recommend it to people? Yeah, it's a good start of mission for this series and some interesting plot elements to get the player interested, despite some room for improvement on the technical section and maybe the gameplay section mm -hmm. as well. Combined with some, some relatively good gameplay sections in a couple of parts, this could be a good mission for KDF players to get into a well-integrated story. I'm actually looking forward to part 2, 3, and 4, and 5. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely interested to see where it goes. I don't know if I was completely drawn in to the series. Like... Um, but I'm definitely interested to see where it goes from now. Hopefully part two really picks up my interest in the plot and stuff, because I yeah. can kind of see where it might be going. 
So I, I'm definitely intrigued to see what's going on here. Um, of course, we're not going to give any major story spoilers because a lot of the story reel comes in at the end on what's going to happen in the future episodes. But uh, do play it, and next week we'll be covering part two, which we could get into spoilers for this part that we reviewed this week because you kind of have to a series, and plus we expect people to go out and play it. Um, well, overall, this part one's got a 6.60 yep. 30th place, which happens to be just above the worst of all worlds. But I do get the impression that that score is going to improve as the series goes on. Yeah, that's so usually I, the case. I'm looking forward to these kind of creative twists in this both story and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So next week we'll be covering part two. We're also planning to do a Foundry discussion next uh, next week for episode 20, Big 20 2 0. And we're going to be talking about the uh, rating system, actually. We're going to give it a, a brief look down because everybody knows we ditched the five-star rating system, so we'll kind of give our opinions on it and how we would change it in-game. Of course, there is no way we could ever get our rating system into the game, so we're going to see... Uh, oh, we're going to take a look at the rating system next week and give our opinions on it and then hopefully get some feedback from you guys so if you want to send that in a while you can go ahead foundryfiles at gmail.com you can start sending in your feedback there we'll be gathering that up um, you can also send us your foundry missions there heck if you made a trailer I know it's really hard because demo record is broken and not getting fixed but you, if you've made a trailer send it in there as well bunch of stuff there also if you have subscribed to us on YouTube my goal is during the course of this week is to send you a link to a new video we're posting. It's not it's not been posted publicly yet, so, so any of our subscribers are going to get a sneak peek at the new Foundry Files intro, which will debut next episode in episode 20. So those of you who've subscribed, first of all, thank you. You're helping out the show quite a bit by continuing to get every episode. Uh, but it's also... So our thank you is going to be you get a sneak peek at our awesome new uh, podcast intro thing. It, we had somebody come in, create a bunch of CGI footage. It's awesome. I showed it to Wee Wee. Loved it. Uh, the guy was Lee Andrews. He does a bunch of CGI work. He's great at it. I love it. The whole intro is awesome. So I can't wait for next. I was like, I, I thought about putting it into this episode. I'm like, it's episode 19. Episode 20 is going to be a lot more special. Even though I love, I loved it. I was like, oh, I have to use this old intro, which I wasn't really happy with. But uh, I think that's it. Do you have anything you want to? Do you have a, a quick tip on uh, Stowe gameplay -ness? you want to get out there quick wee wee before we go? I know he's pretty good. Like, be good at the game. Um, do well. Do well at foundrying. <laughs> That's my quick tip for this week. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Intro. Boom! <laughs> Hello, it's Mr. Sulu. I don't know where he is, though. Do you know? No. Damn, Russell doesn't know either. Spud doesn't know. Nobody knows. We gotta find he, he was him. He was captured by Jeff. Damn. Screw Jeff, Jeff. I don't like Jeff. Why did you guys call him Jeff on that run? I don't know. <laughs> Television just made up a name for him. He's like, we need a name for that terrible man. Let's call him Jeff, and it's stuck. Jeff. I bet he has a British I like, accent. I, I was like, that's gonna stick, and it has. <laughs> I bet he has a British accent. Because, <laughs> of course, yeah. Killer Bay would never make a, an Undine without a British accent. Alright, here we go. Intro for Foundry Files in 3, 2, 1. But, uh, I completely zoned out. What was I talking about before? <laughs> I went off in a tangent. What did I say with the Gecko interview that made me transition to zero? Do you remember? The 20 reviews. The 20 reviews, there we go. What was it though? I had a specific point and now I forgot. Holy crap! It's twenty Blooper. reviews. Blooper. Oh man, that's bad. There was a. She answered the question too, and now I forget what her answer was. You're terrible. I am. Oh god.